next guest in this series is Professor Dame Julia Higgins, who is a woman who I've always enormously admired. She's been hugely influential in mm -hmm. science, not only in, in, uh, in education, but also in science policy. Uh, she's a physicist, a chemical engineer, and she has had a very illustrious career at Imperial College. I would love to know about your experiences as a woman at Imperial College early on, I mean, going back. I joined the chemical engineering department. There were already several women on the staff, which was quite unusual in engineering. There were two or three, and there was one woman professor, Anita Bailey, if you mm -hmm. ever met Anita. So it wasn't completely unusual to have a woman there. I'd, I'd come through university and doing research being one of the few, so I was used to being in small numbers. And I cannot remember anything in my time on the staff in chemical engineering which was in any way sort of prejudicial against me. I was unusual in that I, I wasn't an engineer by background. I come in as, as a scientist, but half, half the staff in chemical engineering were. Its name was chemical engineering and chemical technology. So it wasn't a big deal that I'd come with science background. Um, most of my experiments were done elsewhere. They were done with neutron scattering at a reactor. We might talk about that in a bit. Um, so I didn't need a lot of lab space. I had quite an international community that I already interacted with. So I, I felt quite comfortable. I, I would say that for the first few years, I didn't think the department took much notice of what research I was doing. On the other hand, being ignored wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. Um, and I got involved with teaching. I would say the worst thing was a sort of loneliness. Um, and I heard it very well described by somebody the other day, talking about some other department. Um, they had just joined a department and they said, I see the young men go and collect each other and go off to lunch. And they often collect the professor and take the professor with them. I can't go and say to the professor, come to lunch with me. Social norms don't allow me to do mm. that. And I think it's still the case, and it certainly was the case there. I didn't feel I could go and collect my male colleagues that I didn't know very well yet mm. and go off to lunch. So I'm slightly lonely, but only marginally. That really has changed, hasn't it? I think it has changed. Yeah. Certainly yes. in medical schools, it's changed massively. Yeah. Um, well, you're part of a mixed group, probably. And women dom dom dominate the course. Um, and it, it, it was only probably for the first year or so till I got to know people. And what about this business about doing research in a testosterone-driven environment? Um, I was very lucky in the field I chose, um, chose, fell into probably. Um, first of all, uh, I was using neutron scattering. It was a very new technique being used in the physical sciences. So there wasn't a hierarchy around. And also I had something that was unusual. Uh, I had something to give, to bring to the table that other people hadn't got. And secondly, I worked on polymers. And polymers and as a branch of material science, really. But it wasn't. Most materials science departments didn't do polymer science because they come from metallurgy. Mm -hmm. um, so where did you find polymer science? You might find it in a chemistry department. You might find it in a physics department. Or in my case, you might find it in an engineering department. It had no strong hierarchy. It didn't have 300 years history and everybody believing that you had to do the next best equation in quantum mechanics. So it was not testosterone driven in the same way. It's funny how it dominates now though, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, but I still think being in that field, you would find it a fairly unhierarchical field. Tell us a little bit about neutron scattering, if you would, and, and, its, and its relevance. Um, the neutron is a useful particle for bouncing off things. So you can use a neutron as you can use an electron in an electron microscope or as you can use x-rays, or as you use the whole of the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum to look at the structure and movement of molecules. The, why the neutron is interesting is because it interacts with nuclei, not with the electron cloud. So it's not specifically driven by chemistry in quite the same way that x-ray scattering or electron microscopy would be, depends on what's in the nucleus. And in particular, um, you have 
a very interesting possibility. You could put, if you take hydrogen, which of course is a very large component of most polymeric materials, you can substitute it or you can substitute for it deuterium. Mm. The chemistry is the same, but the nucleus is now twice as heavy. Yeah. The neutrons, as far as it's concerned, the deuterium's a different species. So if you get your chemist to make you your polymer molecule, polystyrene, with all the hydrogen replaced with deuterium, and you mix that molecule in with the others, as regards a neutron beam, you might as well have painted it bright red. Okay. So you can detect individual molecules in among their fellows in a way that no other technique allows mm. you to do. And at that point in polymer science, and, and it's continued as a question, but it was a very strong question, what shape is a polymer molecule? How does a polymer molecule move? And there were no direct te techniques for looking at it. So I got involved. I didn't actually start doing neutron scattering from polymer molecules. I started doing it from um, different chemical species in Oxford. I then did a postdoc in Manchester and started doing the neutron scattering from polymer molecules there. And the big questions were exactly that. Can we see what shape the molecule is? And I got involved with a group the group in Manchester and subsequently with the group in um, France and we published some of the uh, among the very first papers one of them was in Nature which showed that the theoretical prescriptions of what shape the molecule would have were indeed correct there were huge arguments you know the sort of arguments you see in biology when when nobody can see the answer so you can all have an opinion well there were people having violent arguments about what shape the molecules could be. And was that mathematically predicted? Um, if it's in a melt, uh, so if you take a piece of molten polymer, um, which will flow rather viscously, um, in that state it is predicted to form a random walk, which is a very well-known problem in physics. It, the problem in physics says if you take hundreds of steps, thousands of steps, each the same length, but you don't specify in which direction. So it's sometimes called the drunkard's walk. Mm -hmm. Going, so you do step, 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 all over the place. If you do enough of them, statistically, you know precisely the, different, the distance between your beginning point and your end point. You don't know exactly where you've been, but you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So you know the size of the molecule. Mm -hmm. So the prediction from the theoreticians was the polymer molecule will have the shape of a random walk which, among other things, means that its size depends, depends on the square root of its molecular weight. And that was the first experiment we did. Somebody made lots of deuterated molecules, and we measured that. Was that... I mean, did your doctorate start you on, on, that, on that line of...? No, that my doctorate started, again, a very, a very young physical chemist who just arrived from Australia in Oxford, who was starting doing research, and he was interested in what are called inclusion compounds. What that means is two sorts of chemist, chemistry, two sorts of molecules, and one of the molecules makes a framework, like 3D wire netting, mm -hmm. and the second molecule is trapped inside the wire netting. And he was very interested in how those trap molecules would work, and he immediately saw when he was introduced to the idea of neutron scattering that if he could put deuterium all over the wire netting, he will be able to see, or we will be able to see, what the trap molecule were doing. So I, from my physics degree, moved into a chemistry department with this question. Um, and um, the first thing he said to me, well, we're going to have to deuterate the quinone, which yeah, is the wire okay. I hadn't done any chemistry for f five years so at that point. On. I gave it up at 15. And did, was that by that time we were imperial then? Or? No, no, this was, was all in Oxford. In I Oxford. did, my, did okay. my PhD. So what did you do when, when you arrived in imperial? What were you doing then? I, by that stage, I was fully embedded in doing studying polymer molecules, which is why I finished up here, because um, I was, it, it was the, the idea was to grow the number of people doing science and engineering on polymer molecules. Um, at what stage were you elected to the Royal Society? Oh, uh, 20 odd years later. Right. In 1995. But the basic work which led to that was quite a lot earlier, wasn't it? 
Well, it was it was it was ongoing. I think I, yeah. I was still using neutron scattering. The the problems just spread out and out because as soon as you say, well, I can see the molecule, you say, well, what does mm. it do if I stretch the material? What does yeah. it do if I put it in? in yeah, the, the simple question, what shape is it? It was that was long gone. Yeah. Okay. And um, you became increasingly an engineer too. Well, I mean, there I was in chemical engineering. I, I felt I felt very much an imposter because, of course, I'd never studied anything to do with engineering. Um, but I taught. I was allowed to teach the things I knew about, and I taught for a very long time the first year physics and chemistry course about molecules. So they had the background in modern physics. I'm going to ask you a question which I'm slightly reluctant to ask you, actually, because I get asked this by school children all the time, and I, I hate the question. So I don't feel like very happy about asking you, but I, I feel I must. And I wonder whether you would tell me what you think perhaps your greatest scientific achievement is. Um, it, it wasn't, for me, doing the shape of the molecule, although being associated with that was great. But the next question was um, to do with the dynamics. And there was a big development going on. There was um, a French professor, Pierre Gilles de Gênes, who subsequently got a Nobel Prize, not just for his polymer work. Very great English professor, Sam Edwards, who had been in Manchester when I was there and was now in Cambridge. And essentially, they, they began to describe how to make a, a scientific framework to try and describe how this thing would move. You, you imagine a, a ball of hundreds of pieces of, sp of string all tangled together. And you say, well, how does this, you know, this thing moves. We know it moves because you can flow that stuff. You can stretch it. You can compress it. And the model was that it, if you look at and in, so I painted one molecule red, and I can look at it. You, you've somehow got to describe its motion and everything else around it. Mm -hmm. So it's a many body problem. But the insight was to say, actually, on a short time scale, everything around it isn't moving that fast. So Sam Edwards first described it as a tunnel or a tube. He said, all the other molecules are making a tunnel around my one molecule, which has got to somehow move in that space. And the question question was, how does it move in that space? De Gênes was the guy who invented the term to describe it called reptation, which refers to reptile, which refers to the way a snake moves. So a snake always moves along its own contour. If you imagine a snake on the floor, it wriggles along its own shape. If you think it's, a, it's an S shape. So the idea was the only way this molecule can easily move is along its own tunnel. And the question was, what is the reality of the tunnel? And yeah. can you can you, so the experiments that I was involved with, and I am, it's not my best known paper, but it's one I'm proudest of, was to do an experiment which actually demonstrated that this this molecule could wriggle about a bit, but if it tried to wriggle too far, it just effectively stopped dead. It couldn't it couldn't get out of the tube. So it's wriggling randomly. Yeah. Um, but, it's directed, but it's directed by the shape of things around it. And that was a paper in about 1984, I think. Right. No, perhaps later than that. And then, then there were some other ones um, when I got into polymer blends. But there wasn't a, that wasn't a single a paper. It was a whole line of achievement where we developed the ideas. I think we'd love to hear a bit about the translational relevance of some of that stuff. The uh, what you mean? How useful is how, it? <laughs> how we use it? Yes. Um, well, the the model that was developed to describe the motion of the polymer molecules allowed the physicists and chemists to speak to the engineers. There had been no language yeah. that translate that that allowed somebody who wanted to use the thing. They, what they wanted was an equation to describe the motion. They could set up equations, but they had no relationship to molecular dynamics and structure. What what this theory did was relate the two. So my little contribution to that was a piece in the mm. steps that held the theory together. And that, that's been hugely important for the engineering of polymers. The other work that I've done on polymer blends, most polymers are used in mixtures, either real molecular mixtures, but very often 
um, inhomogeneous and, in a sense, unstable, except they're frozen in position. And the thermodynamics of that is quite interesting, and the dynamics of how you form it. And again, we've contributed not so that somebody goes says, aha, she's done that, she's shown this, but more, ah, we in industry have made this material and we don't quite know why it works like that. So contributing to the understanding of what industry often develops before they know what they're doing. And of course, some of this thinking is relevant to biology too, isn't it? Mm, yes. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. The molecules, DNA is just as good a molecule. In fact, some beautiful experiments, this business of moving along the mm. tube, some beautiful experiments were done by the guy Steve Chu mm. in Stanford. Mm. And he, he tagged DNA molecules and used them essentially in a microscope and molecular tweezers to pull them and show them mm. moving through the um, this, this network in the most beautiful experiments that actually demonstrated with light, not, not using esoteric neutrons, what was going on. They were, they were lovely. Whether it this explains life, I don't know, but it was a lovely demonstration. It was laser light, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, so I'm not... I think, interestingly, the, more, the, high, the greater understanding of what polymer molecules do has not yet really, my impression, impinged on biology properly. <laughs> Although, of course, they're starting to use polymers for some of these uh, sort of nano um, applications of yes, medicine, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so they're using 3D printing with polymers, of course, Yeah, oh, they? sure. And, of course, wonderful polymeric materials being used in tissue replacement, the mm. sort of thing that Molly Stevens yeah. does here. Yeah. Um, but that's not really relating back to the, the physics of understanding how the damn thing moves, if I can say. Now, I've gazed with... A mixture of fondness and admiration at your portrait in the Royal Academy of Engineering. <laughs> the one that I sit under at meetings is terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is. It's quite imposing. Yeah. Well, they've made them very big, those. <laughs> yeah. And when, when were you? When when did you become a, a fellow of the Academy? Um, about four years after I became yeah. a fellow of the Royal Society, which yeah. and completely surprised me. I didn't expect that to happen at all. And you've become a pretty influential member of the, of the Academy of. Engineering. Well, there are. I am not going to say it's only because I'm a woman, but there are very few women, and so we are rather valuable to the Royal Academy of Engineering. And they know it too. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, to be fair, it's really appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I sort of, kind of um, feel it's taken quite a long time. Really, it's amazing when you consider that people like Marie Curie, for example, were working on radiation all those years ago. But you know, she was never elected to the no. French Academy. No, I know. I mean, that's horrifying. But she got two Nobel Prizes, but yeah, still wasn't exactly. elected. No. What about women running, running departments in, in uh, scientific establishments? Um, relative, well, because until recently, there have been relatively few female professors because <laughs> you, there weren't very many female staff members and fewer of them get to be professors. Just as an aside, when I became professor here, I doubled the number of female professors at that point in time in the whole of Imperial College. So you wouldn't become a head of department unless you were a professor and there weren't very many. So the the chance of becoming a head of department was relatively low. Then I think quite a lot of women don't think that's the job for them. And I'm not talking about false modesty. I didn't want to be head of department. I thought it was a not a job I wanted to do. And of course, one of the practical jobs you did was as um, in, in the um, Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, which of course was incredibly male dominated. And I remember, you know, you were sitting there at the top there. And I think Sue Arns was on the on the on 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 council at that stage, wasn't she? There weren't very many women around the table, though. Not very many. There were a few. Yes. Yeah. Now that you see that, you you talked about it being a head of department. I never wanted to do that. I extremely happily chaired things. I really enjoyed chairing EPSLC. You were I, wonderful at it too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I everybody everybody thought really that you were a fantastic chairman. I am. Um, if, if I analyse what I'm good at, I think I'm a very good chair. I mean, I I don't mind singing my own praises as chairing something. It's something I thoroughly enjoy doing. I don't know quite when I started to enjoy it. Yes, I mean, I... I mean, I can, I can be a really bad chairman, I have to say. Yeah. 
I'm not organized enough, but you were very organized. Um, what do you think were the achievements of the Research Council while you were chairing it? Um, <laughs> we, d we eventually got a new high thought performance computer. Do Hector. you remember that? Hector, yeah, I do, and the amount of electricity it used. Yes, well, the, tr the problem was that the, the um, at that point, the only way you get really high performance computing power was to share it. So the research, no individual university could afford to provide that sort of power for its own people. So it needed to be shared. And the computing community had come forward with a proposal for the new um, computer in a, if I can say so, a rather arrogant way, assuming that everybody understood that it was essential they had it. Now, it was to cover the, all the research councils, but we, the EPSLC, were to be the custodians of the bid and to see it through. And so we were landed with all the flack that said, why, why do these people need this? It's a hell of a lot of money. And it hadn't been properly, the project hadn't been thought through so that the, 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 the reasons for doing it and the choice of what was to be done hadn't been thought through. I, I said at one point, you know, Mary, one of the Queen Marys, said she would die with Calais engraved on her mm. heart. I mm. said I was going to die with whatever this... I can't Hector. remember what, he, what it was called. Hector. It had a name, didn't it? The yes. Computing project. Anyway, I was going to die with it engraved <laughs> on my heart. Um, so uh, is that an achievement? Well, we saw it through. Um, and then you found that EDF were going to charge you much more for electricity yeah. than you'd budgeted. Yes, that was that was the next chair. It was after me. Um, I, I think we kept... a. It wasn't the easiest time, and I think we kept a stable ship. I, I mean, which is not a great achievement, but it's probably not bad. Well, you probably had the most flourishing budget, of course, that the physical sciences have had yes. to administer. We, they were still working through the consequences of the change in structures because there was a whole raft of people who'd grown up with research councils where there were subcommittees and committees and... In, in subject areas. And the people who'd grown up through that and who had sat on those committees thought it was absolutely the best way of organising the science. As was pointed out fairly strongly, those people who didn't sit on the committees didn't think it was the fairest way of organising science because the committees, not in any fraudulent sense, but undoubtedly looked after their own. And they changed the whole structure. The committees were not permanent. They had no permanent chairs. They had lost the link to the scientific community, mm. I think, mm. and it, well, it was still working through that, and it's not clear they've ever really got it back again. The other thing that was happening, of course, in the physical sciences, and it was partly, I guess your background was quite important, was the growing recognition that we're all interconnected. Yes. So biology suddenly became really important to EPSRC, didn't yes. it? Yes, yes, it did. Um, and the bridge was not... Again, it wasn't very easy to make that bridge. It was partly because the the funding came in chunks. And, and somehow or other, if you put a chunk into interdisciplinary work across to biology, it was seen by the chemists or the physicists as taking their money and putting it somewhere else. So it wasn't... I don't know whether it was not a helpful regime, but it wasn't a helpful historical view of what was going on. Um... So there, there was, I'm trying to remember, there was a joint funding panel across the two, across EPSLC and BBSLC, as I recall. Yes, there was. But I'm not sure that it was... It didn't had, su didn't, didn't survive. They then no. end up with RCUK, of course, didn't they, which sort of... Been well, a... yes, but that never funded things. It, you, there, no. There's still the structure, EPSLC, mm. BBSLC, mm. PPART. The other thing, of course, we were we were struggling with the funding, and I was involved in that research council as well, the the one that held the facilities like CERN, but more importantly, the um, uh, reactor at, well, not the reactor, the pulse source at um, Rutherford and the reactor in Grenoble, which were science research council facilities. Um, and they, they took them all, and they had been run by... Were you responsible for Cullum as well at that time? No. no. We, we I was... Cullum? must have come under PPAR. I, I think, think it did. So we had the, the user facility. But we contributed through EPSRC for some of the money, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we did. Hmm. Um, so I would, I sat on two 
two research councils effectively. The EPSRC, before I was chair, when I was chair I was not doing that, but before that I was sitting on EPSRC and CCLRC, mm. it was called the Central Something mm. of the... Mm. which subsequently became STFC. Well, you were, you were effectively responsible for nearly a billion pounds worth of public spending Yes. Um, in, in what you were administering. Yeah. And you did something, I think, well, I mean, obviously I'm very grateful to you for one reason, not, for, not, not, not the only reason, but of course you started to understand the public responsibility, didn't you? Yes, it, was, it, it wasn't me only driving it, but I do feel some responsibility for setting up Whatever we, we, the what do we call it? Um, we, we, we had. Um, um, I can't remember. But you set up a committee which looked which looked at the relevance of how we would engage the wider community with what we yeah. were doing and, and what our responsibility to them was. Oh, that's right. There were there were two existing panels. There were two. That's top, right. which is technical opportunities panel. And we were up, SIP, and you were SIP. SIP. Top up and which SIP. Which was societal. Societal. Imp- uh, impact or something. I can't remember. It wasn't impact, but it was, yeah. 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 No, and uh, so the, 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 the idea was floating around that it, it, the research councils ought to look at the public impact and the potential for public input of views. And we invented you, I think, and you, I was incredibly glad that you, you agreed to well, I was everything. delighted to be asked, actually. I mean, for me, and we it was got Honora onto it, didn't we? Honora Neal. Neal was wonderful. I mean, just this is not for the camera, but I mean, the thing about Honora was that she's the brightest person I know, Absolutely. and it's terrifying chairing a committee that she's on. I bet, I bet. <laughs> because, I've watched her sort she, of almost. She doesn't speak much. Of, no, she doesn't but when say, she does, she says very little. But when <laughs> she does, you know that you've actually said far too much. Yeah. She's, she, and she, but she's lovely. I mean, she's yeah. a very nice woman. It's, it's very interesting. That question's still around. We were talking about it just just yesterday. What what is public engagement, and should should anybody be doing it? Yes. Or should we just? What's it for? Well, it's an interesting question. I think for Imperial College, because of course Imperial College is now doing. A, well, of course you were very much involved with outreach, but it's sort of grown and grown. Yeah. And of course we have a a lot of clout, I think, now with schools, not just in London, but elsewhere. And I wanted to ask you about education, because first of all, the city and guilds. Yes. So perhaps you'd like to tell me a little bit about that. City and guilds is, is quite old. In fact, it's, it's as old as the oldest bit of the college. And in about the 80s, 1880s, I have to say, they realised they needed some way of educating the top end of engineering, not just te- technical people. And they started a college whose name I can never remember, so I'm not going to say it now, something like the Advanced College, which subsequently, when Imperial College was formed in about 1910, became the engineering arm of Imperial College, along with the Royal School of Mines and the Royal College of Science. And the link to the college was maintained for, and is still maintained, as a part of the college was always called City and Guilds. And that was the engineering faculty. It, we never used the word faculty then. Um, and the dean of city and guilds in the college, so the dean of engineering, immediately had a close link with city and guilds of London. The main job of city and guilds in London is providing vocational qualifications. They're a qualifications institution. They uh, they validate courses at every level of practicality, from gardening right up to quite um, advanced technical subjects, but they wanted to maintain the connection with the academic branch, which is Imperial College. And at some point, two things were introduced. One was called Associate of City and Guilds of London Institute, and every engineering graduate from Imperial gains the name tag ACGI. So all our engineering graduates can go out with ACGI. Really? And I was know. told once that it's like a visiting card. If if they put it on their um, visit their own cards, then somebody looks and says, oh, were you Imperial College? Were you ACGI? But they also then introduced a, a qualification fellow. And I think you are a fellow. I'm a fellow, yeah. For FCGI. Of, and originally it was just a senior qualification for people who already had ACGI. And then they realised <laughs> they would spread it out so to a, senior to people, people in science and engineering and education who would form a, 
a senior advisory cohort in the most general sense to City and Guilds of London Institute. And the connection has been maintained. And in fact, we now call the building, the Mechanical Engineering Building, the City and Guilds Building. And on the wall in there, you will see all the crests of the, the guilds who were involved in the setting up mm. of, the, mm. of the Imperial College. So mm. it's a, there's a very strong connection. Now your connection with education generally is, is, is massive and of course you sat on the, the Vision Committee at the Royal Society and you're on the Education Committee. Tell us a bit about that and your vision for education. <laughs> well my vision for education... Because you were a formidable member of that committee I think. Uh, it, it's, it's to, I don't know, we, had, we, we finished with about six key options but to me the, the, the whole thrust of it was inclusivity which was to get everybody doing to the best of their ability what they could to make sure that everybody had a broad education. So one of our thrusts was that everybody should do mu something much more like a baccalaureate. Mm. The sciences much more in the arts mm. and communications and vice versa. That everybody should be able to do this. There shouldn't be any exclusion. And the only way to achieve all of this was to support the teachers and to support the teachers in every way possible, uh, which includes outreach because the teachers need the assistance of the universities and the laboratories and the learning centres and the, what do they call the practical centres? There's a name for them and I can't think um, what they call But the learning centres are the ones that have got all the publicity. Yeah. Them. So to me, it was about inclusivity, broadening the subject and particularly supporting school teachers. I was a school teacher for a short time. I don't know whether you knew that. For two years between my PhD and coming back as a researcher, I taught in a grammar school. So I experienced it for the other side. I mean, there were quite a few teachers on that vision committee, of course, yeah. weren't there? Um, and some of them were doing primary and some of them were doing secondary. And, of course, we had an ex-secretary of state for education. Oh, Charles Clark. Charles yes. Clark. Um, and the education committee at the Royal Society now? Well, that... Um, it's, it's quite interesting. Vision, the Vision Project, has become a key part of the strategy of the Education Committee. The other part is higher education. We're about to embark on a, a piece of work which is to ask the question, what is a PhD and what's it for? Which, if you think, is a pretty fundamental question for higher education. But if you look around, there are views that range from slave labour in a laboratory to developing your whole innovative thinking. And somewhere in between, everybody's PhD experience sits. And women in science, tell us about that. And the well, of course, Imperials is a very interesting place to observe that because even with the incorporation of the medical schools, we have relatively few women at the, at the academic level. We have a huge variation across our undergraduate courses from, I think, about 60% in medicine to 10% in mechanical mm. engineering. Mm. So... But overall, the average is about 30%, mm. I think, something like that. Um, and then you go to academic staff, and the numbers are small and smaller as you go up to the professoriate. So 15 or so years ago, when I was a dean, uh, I talked to one or two other senior women, and we thought we ought to get the college to look at the position of women. We had very few women at the senior level, and it didn't seem to be increasing. And we got Ron Oxborough, who was then rector, to um, have a session at the, he had the away day for staff, the annual away day for all the senior academic staff. And we collected all the information we could. And it was pretty depressing. There weren't very many women, and any sort of survey that had been done said a lot of them were very unhappy because they felt lonely, they didn't feel that their pro they were progressing. And... Uh, after the session, Ron Oxborough said to me, what do you want to happen next? And I said, I want a committee, please. Uh, a rector's committee. Those were the committees that answered directly to the rector. And he agreed with that. We called it Academic Opportunities. And we started doing, first of all, finding out what the women thought and then looking to see what would help them. And we started the Elsie Widdowson Fellowships, which are, when a woman is away on maternity leave, she gets and all women who ask can get this, when she comes back, her department 
is paid to cover her teaching and admin, so she just does research. And women have said to me that was so liberating, they didn't feel guilty about doing their research mm. when they came back. Mm. Our point being that you never get promoted in Imperial if your research falls away. Mm. Now, that wouldn't be true elsewhere. At about the same time, nationally, the same questions were being asked, and I was getting involved not only in the one in Imperial, but what was going on nationally. And that was the so-called Athena Project, um, which was again looking at the same questions. We got money from the then head of HEFSI, Brian Fender. Hmm. I remember going to a meeting with Caroline Swan, who was here, and Nancy Lane from Cambridge. And we thought, he'd said, well, I'll put some money into this from HEFSI. And we thought, well, we might get 10 or 20K. And we got a quarter of a million, which meant over three years we could really set up projects and run very I didn't realise that Nancy Lane was involved with that. Yeah, well, she she was one of the people who started it off from... She was... She, she was wonderful, of course. Yeah. She's sort of moved... But she's got. She's not so much part of the academic community, so in recent years mm. she's not been so involved. There's a photograph of me, Caroline Swan, Nancy Lane and Bram Fender at, at a meeting five years later, the founders of the Athena Project. Out of the Athena project came the Athena Swan Awards, which everyone mm. in the college knows about. Um, and, of course, the college is very proud to have a silver award. And I finished up as patron of the Athena Swan Award, so I hand out all the certificates. Of course, you're finally, I mean, you're not only a patron, you're also a dame, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> what was it like becoming a dame? It always sounds terribly grand. Well, it was funny. Of course, my first thought was, I, I don't think I approve of this. Perhaps I shouldn't accept. And I asked a few people, including Dot Griffiths, and they said, don't be so stupid. The men have their pretty toys. You go and accept your pretty toy. What did the Queen say to you? Actually, it wasn't the Queen. It was Prince Charles. Oh, what did he say? Uh, well, the, the dame insignia is much more cumbrous than the, the male one. You have a medal yes, around your neck. Yes. For the females, you get a badge and a sort of diamond-shaped star thing on a huge pin. Now, when you when you get these things that are going to be pinned to your lapel, they they put a like a, a, a blank pin on the front so that so that whoever is giving it to you doesn't have to stab you in the. So <laughs> Prince Charles came towards me with this thing with a, I, I kid you not, the pin's about that long, pointing at me, and I must have looked horrified because he he said. I've never missed one yet. That was what <laughs> Prince Charles said to me.